Hello and welcome to New York City Pub New York City uh, Category Theory Seminar, uh, 3rd of November. This week we're having Dusko Pavlovich, University of Ohio, uh, Hawaii, talk about geometry of computation in monoidal in a monoidal computer in monoidal, in a monoidal computer. Um, fire away, go. Okay, so thanks for inviting me. Um, I. I mentioned that I'm speaking to you from the future, from, from tomorrow, not so much uh, because of the time difference, but to mention that I, I'm not in Hawaii and I, uh, the Dutch climate ga gives us this, this wonderful sinus headache. So I hope I'll, I'll be coping with it without any repercussions on the, on the talk, but um, I am subject to it. Here, here at midnight. So uh, since you gave me, I believe it's announced that it's more than an hour talk. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming that I have an hour to, to speak. So I, I have about 7 million slides, you, which means you, that you should, uh, you better interrupt me at any moment when, uh, when you have a question or when I have not automatically answered myself to, to, to something that's worrying you about my slides because um, yeah, because I'd like that and, and because I, uh, I have too many slides, so I, I'm, I won't present everything. So you, you, you could talk as long as you want, as long as you don't consider anybody leaving to be rude. That's our- I don't problem. consider anybody re leaving to be rude, but on the other hand, I consider those interrupting me to be even less rude. That, okay. that's, that's what I'd like to say. Okay. Um, Anyway, let's begin with, so what's the, what's the idea of, I'm, I'm talking about this, you know, computer in pictures, which, which allows us to present computability categorically, which has been done probably in many different ways. So what's the point and what's the intuition? Machines um, are the source of the intuition. So we live among the machines human machines and artificial machines. And here's one which you remember from school. It takes pairs of digits as inputs and it produces a, a sequence of pairs of digits as inputs and produces a sequence of digits as an output. And it keeps adding these digits. And when it can't output them as a single digit, then it changes state and carries um, over the digit into the next operation and it's the binary adder and then you can uh, then people got smart and said well i can actually build build these machines so that they can be modified that several such machines can can be packed into into the same one and then it can not only add but also multiply numbers although it can add numbers of arbitrary length and it can definitely not multiply uh, numbers of arbitrary length uh, as a finite state machine. And uh, then they can get even smarter and they can make machines which combine these operations in such a way that the output cannot be recognized from the input or the proper output cannot be generated at, unless, you, unless you plug up or connect several such machines uh, and, 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 and add to the one the same key which the other one had. So this is this is the Enigma machine, and then um, and then they actually um, uh, start adding physical aspects to it. So they can instead of just digits, they can put laundry into it, which is actually nothing special. I mean, every, everyone knows that every washer contains a little computer, but if you think about it, there is a sense in which every computer is a washer because these physical things uh, are coming in and out. We, you know, we, we don't, so we solve physical puzzles. We don't take puzzle as an input and, and think about it, but we twiddle with it. So computers also twiddle with things. And then we can continue doing the same things, pack these physical functions together. And um, the common denominator of all of these machines is, um, that each of them has a function, but more importantly, that different machines realize different functions. Whenever you see a function, you build a different machine. 
And then as these functions get complicated, they start, they start using each other. Uh, they start packing lots of functions to achieve what they need to achieve. And they even start using other machines. And at that point, certain threshold is, is crossed when, when to achieve certain functions, these uh, machines stop being tied to a, to a single purpose and, uh, and start being able to uh, recognize each other, not only to use one another uh, for their particular purpose, but to serve other machines purposes, to recognize, to be able to reprogram themselves to do what other machines do. This is what Alan Turing realized while he was asking himself what happens with people we love when they die. And, uh, and he solved the, the, the mind-body problem. So, uh, in a way, here we have a, a, a purpose-driven machine and another purpose-driven machine. And uh, more than driven by their purposes, they start being driven by programs. And then these programs can be modified. So, so a machine which was built for one purpose can, can serve another purpose and another purpose and many other purposes. And uh, we go from these purpose-driven machines uh, to universal machines. And uh, so a universal machine would be, would be a machine can, that can do anything that any other machine um, of its type can do. And that is, this, uh, that is the idea of a universal computer. It's a, it's, a, uh, it's a function which when you give it some input, it does anything that any other function in its universe can do. Um, so if, if we're given a computation, what's a computation? A computation is some function for which there's a program. And what's a computer? A computer is a function such that, or any other function, there's a program which, uh, su such that uh, uh, the computer can perform that function, which we then call computable. So I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm just saying in words what, what everyone has seen. And then in slightly different words, I mean, this was, this was what, what, what Alan Turing noticed when he, when he said, well, if I add to these machines external memory, then they're gonna be taking data. And uh, among the other data, this thing which Gödel did, some data can describe functions and then they can input these descriptions and and they can be, they, they'll be computers. Um, they will work like computers. Computers were in Alan Turing times, Alan Turing's time, some people who were, who were working on a, on census, I believe. And then uh, John von Neumann slightly modified that and, uh, and uh, moved it closer to the engineering and made the distinction between hardware and software, which is, which is the distinction where, that, that we've been living with ever since. So let's make some math out of, out of this story. First, I'm gonna, in order to be able to say all this in pictures and yet uh, somewhat precisely, first I'm gonna introduce what, what is quite well known to, to, to category theorists. I, I, I suppose everyone here knows this. First, uh, data services without variables. So here, their types will be will be drawn as strings and data which are which are traveling through uh, through these strings to be thought of as as channels um, will then be uh, will that which are normally uh, referred to by variables will be able to elide these variables from and then uh, parallel composition of types, uh, 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 product types will be just putting two strings together. And the uh, unit type is the invisible string. So next to any string, we imagine, we can imagine any number of invisible strings, which are the unit types. And then uh, data can be swapped. So, so our type system is a, is a uh, so this, the, the, this parallel composition is the, 
is the monoidal keyword and the monoidal is symmetric since data can be swapped. This corresponds to, to, uh, to reversing the order of, of variables. So we can uh, also then uh, produce multiple copies of, uh, of data, which are, which are these forks in, uh, in the strings. Uh, and we can then uh, manipulate, uh, deliver our data as we do by referring to them uh, using variables. And uh, so constant uh, data, such as number zero here, or procedures, which are the functions that take no inputs, are denoted by triangles. Uh, computations are denoted by boxes. So I'm just in introducing these things. I mean, these slides are, to be honest, from my from my uh, from my undergraduate course. Uh, so I introduce students who don't know any category theory and swear that they have never heard about induction. I I I, I use use these pictures, and so I start from scratch and introduce pictures on their own account. I apologize if I'm boring someone, but there's no more than three or four more slides about this. So boxes and then um, identity functions are the invisible boxes, which so every, every string corresponds to the identity of that type. And then we can also compose these functions in parallel by just, by just uh, drawing these boxes adjacent to one another next to one another. Um, and um, um, so we can also compose them sequentially by uh, piping the output string from one function uh, into as, as an input string into the other function. And uh, last but not least, data can be deleted. This is in our computer, the only thing that would cost us energy and uh, and now we're in the business to say what is uh, really so I, I've been using the word functions but we didn't really have total and single valued computation so far but a total computation will be uh, will be something that um, if we uh, whenever whenever we can delete the input we'll be able to delete its output that's what we, this equation says and uh, a single valued uh, computation is the computation where if we can produce two copies of its output, uh, it is the same thing as if we produce two copies of the input and the ru run the thing twice. Uh, it means that it always produces the same input. So these total single valued computations are what, what we have been calling functions. We need to be able to distinguish that. And, and they are uh, distinguished in, in the diagrams by these dots, which I, which I draw on the out, at the output point. Maybe I should remove this picture of myself from, from what I'm sharing with you, or at least minimize it like this. Um, no, it doesn't. Uh, I, we, we see it the same size. You're perfect, you're perfect. Okay, um, and uh, so what else do I want to say about, uh -huh. okay, so what is the upshot of all of this? So normally diagrams being two dimensional have diagonals and stuff. And here strings prevent you to read these uh, string diagrams across. So the point of string diagrams is that they are literally two dimensional text. You can read every string diagrams either bottom up or left to right, or, or you know, like, like with all languages, some people write right to left, and some people read string diagrams uh, top down. That that is that is uh, free and, and 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 a matter of habit. But the fact that there are just two directions uh, of reading these diagrams is something that matters because then. Uh, so how can we read this particular diagram? We can say, oh, I'm gonna. Uh, post compose F with G. And on the other hand, I'm gonna post compose T with S, uh, with S and then I'm sequentially, and then I'm gonna compose these two things in parallel. 
So I have read the whole thing horizontally. First, I have produced the left-hand string, and then I have produced the right-hand string, and then I have composed from left to right. Or I can say, well, I'm first gonna compose in parallel F and T. On the other hand, I'm gonna compose in parallel G and S, and then I'm gonna compose these two things sequentially. So I've read it vertically. And these two readings are the same. And that encodes for us this thing, uh, uh, which is known as middle two interchange of, of Godemont law. And uh, so this algebraic law is now uh, hardwired into uh, the geometry of our diagrams. And we never need to write this thing down anymore. And all these equational derivations with the two operations which, uh, which obey uh, middle to interchange law are directly captured by, uh, by string diagrams. And uh, whatever we can, any deformation that we can do with, with, with string diagrams without tearing anything apart, any, any topological uh, deformations will correspond to equations in this, uh, in this uh, data services with parallel and, and, and uh, sequential composition. So for instance, we can slide our boxes along the strings and uh, the equations, the, the, the different readings that, that will uh, result from different diagrams uh, uh, corresponding to the different states of this slide will, uh, will, all, be, will all correspond to the same function. So we have, we have caught, uh, we have captured some of the algebra by, uh, by some of the geometry. But that's just uh, data services. So let's go to the heart of of, uh, of what's a computer? Well, it's the idea is is that uh, uh, thing which I started with um, programmable functions. So wherever you see a function, you can slice off the corner and imagine that it's its program. That's that's the geometric law here. Uh, so program evaluator is a function which we denote here by cleany brackets by curly brackets. Uh, on the right, this uh, trapezoid, uh, such that for every uh, function G of with inputs of type X and A, there is, uh, there is a, a total function. So for any computation G, uh, there is a total function, uh, capital G, which outputs something of type P, a program. And when, uh, when the program evaluator runs this program, uh, capital G, it produces the input output behavior of the little g, the function. So this is, this is our uh, evaluator. So that's, that's the only additional piece of structure that we, that we need for, uh, for monoidal computer in addition to the ordering of this uh, program type. So what does this mean? Uh, now, moreover, uh, remembering that input type, the identity type is invisible. Whenever you see a function of any type, you can imagine either that uh, the identity type is X and that you can then produce A indexed programs, which you run without any additional input to get that function, or else you can get a fixed constant program, which doesn't uh, need any input, uh, but which when run will wait for inputs of type A and produce the behavior F. So there are two ways to, uh, to program in an indexed way and in a fixed way, any given function. So equivalently, and, and uh, okay, another component is that we can apply our um, assumption that every computation can be programmed to the, to the uh, universal evaluator uh, expecting two inputs, X and A. And then we can assume uh, we can take the program type P and the type X to be the indexing arguments and the program then uh, indexed by the types P and X will be the partial evaluator, what is known as partial evaluator. Uh, 
or specializer uh, in, in, some, in some other books. So uh, another special case, which is, which is kind of important that, uh, so we can partially evaluate programs for which we have uh, programs which uh, expect two pieces of input uh, for their computations and partially evaluate it on the first input and produce an output programs where the available inputs of the first type X have been uh, already substituted. And these programs will then wait for the inputs uh, of type A. So this is, uh, I suppose, all uh, self-evident and, and, and perhaps well known. This, this, this goes all the way back to uh, acceptable systems uh, and most people uh, are recognizing these fixed programmability and partial programmability as, as the two axioms of uh, acceptable enumerations in Hartley-Rogers. So our axiom about indexed uh, uh, evaluators uh, is equivalent to that. And uh, in the end, I will, I will actually give you one uh, actually even more uh, or purely categorical version of, of, of that same thing. But in any case, uh, whenever you see a function of two arguments, you can find a fixed program for it and you can partially evaluate it and you will get an indexed program for it. Uh, and the other way around, whenever you have indexed programs, you can, uh, as we have derived, get. So, so the equivalent definition, uh, definition of uh, uh, Universal evaluator for index program would be would be that we have universal evaluators for fixed programs and partial evaluators. So, the definition of monoidal co uh, computer is that it's an arbitrary monoidal. Whenever I say monoidal, I mean symmetric and even strict uh, monoidal category with data services. So I can copy and delete things, and I have distinguished type P, which is well ordered and program evaluators for all pairs A, B. So what can we do with this? So first of all, the first consequence is that every type is a retract of the type of programs. Uh, so this is kind of, everyone knows that, that uh, programs are data, but this says actually that data are programs. We can encode all data as programs by partially evaluating the just any program skip for the identity function that encodes it uh, as a program. And then if we just simply run that program, we will output the data that we have had. Uh, of course, such a thing has, has broad repercussions on, on, the, on, the, uh, on our category, one of which will not be uh, that that there is a partial combinatory algebra in it, because we will we will find uh, we will find that that actually that always provides an extensional collapse. Uh, however, uh, the fact that uh, all uh, all data all uh, all types are retracts of of a single type means, moreover, that also. Uh, all idempotent split. So, so if we swap around these two components uh, of the these uh, these two functions uh, to which each type is is decomposed, the encoding of the type as a program and the decoding of the program into the data of the of the given type. If we swap them around, it's easy to see that we get an idempotent. So, in other words, a type is a sort of a filter. Uh, a projector. It projects away uh, uh, any given program to a to a piece of data of a given type, and uh, and then it outputs uh, a unique code for for that data item. And then if we have an idempotent of an arbitrary type, uh, we certainly know that uh, that we can uh, encode that uh, the the splitting of uh, of that arbitrary type uh, as an idempotent on the type of programs. And moreover, we can then uh, also split that idempotent on, uh, on the first given type, uh, all of that by, by reshuffling these, 
encoding uh, and decoding functions. So uh, all eigenpotent split and uh, all uh, types uh, can be expressed as eigenpotents. Let's derive a, bit, a, a couple more types. So the simplest ones is we choose some program for the first projection and some program for the second projection, and we call them uh, uh, truth and false, uh, where we are using the uh, universal evaluator as a as a bad kind of uh, if branching. Uh, we can we can certainly improve and produce the the, the, the better the, the not so eager if branching. But for the, for the moment, uh, this one does uh, works. And then using using this, we can show that actually we are in a very we're living in a very intentional world because for every computation, we either have infinitely many programs or the whole thing collapses to a singleton. Uh, and then uh, we can also assume uh, that uh, false is less than true. We can choose them that way. Uh, and then we can produce the, the filter, which will output only true or false uh, and uh, uh, not terminate on anything, on anything else. So that, uh, we have the type of booleans. And then we can go on and uh, using these booleans, see what more uh, can we compute in general. So the essence of the, of the whole thing is that uh, the abstraction, the program abstraction <clears throat> is not what uh, Church imagined it originally uh, to be. It's not an operation if we, uh, we know that you know, if someone gives us a function producing an abstraction of it, producing a program is not uh, a computable thing. It's not an easy thing. Uh, so how do we program without, without abstraction? How do we live in this, in this world of functions alone, but we, we don't have an operation of abstraction? So, so that in, in general, uh, I mean, mind you, I'm not, I'm not spelling out any model here because any Turing complete language that comes to your mind right now produces a model. You just take that, uh, you just take literally the expressions of that language uh, to be the, 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 your, your uh, type P and all the filters and idempotents, all the programs that you can express, uh, all the, uh, Projector, projectors that you can express will be your types. The fact that they are idempotents corresponds to the fact that we define recursively enumerable sets in two ways, either as the domains of recursive functions or as images. And uh, that means that, that, uh, that we can combine them into idempotents. So that, uh, that yields uh, a model uh, a monoidal computer out of any uh, programming language, assuming, of course, that that the product types uh, are given and uh, and that there, there is a usual variable mechanism which which gives us the the data service. But how do we do without the abstraction? So that's uh, again most people who have read a recur read a computability theory book. You see this recursion has has gotten into into our minds so that uh, we, we're confusing computability with with recursiveness. Um, we'll, we'll already guess we will be programming using fixed point uh, theorem what uh, what Kleene called his second recursion theorem uh, not realizing actually the, the, the repercussions of it all. So uh, what does it say? It says that, for any, uh, for any computation which takes two inputs, one of which is a program, we can find a program such that uh, when we give that program to, your, to, to our function as an input, uh, it will produce the, the, and when we run that program, uh, when we evaluate it by universal evaluator, we will get the same function from A to B. So, so the, the value uh, 
uh, if any, of function g at gamma uh, for the input x is the same as running the program gamma on x. And uh, the, the proof is uh, with, with, with pictures uh, almost trivial. Um, so we find the program G, capital G, for the function little g precomposed with partial evaluation of programs on themselves. And uh, then the first thing that anyone would do is that they would run this partial evaluator first on the program G itself, which means by the definition of that program that uh, it will be the universal evaluation of that program on uh, that same program substituted as the first, uh, first input, uh, which we can copy and partially evaluate. And now we see that gamma is actually the partial evaluation of this program G on itself. So far for the for Clini, so so and then we go in the business of of programming. What can we program using using uh, just mere fixed points? Again, most people who have been programming will will uh, guess most of my next slides. I skip the quine and and go to the virus, which is uh, a program which doesn't only copy itself, but it copies itself twice and it hides all of that behind some some function. How do we construct that? Well, but mind you, uh, wines are constructed in, in, in competitions uh, based on quirks in, 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 in actual programming languages because uh, people kind of think it's easier for me to find a quirk in uh, syntactic quirk in C than to, than to write uh, a partial evaluator. But as soon as you can write a partial evaluator, you can, you can write a polymorphic wine or polymorphic virus. Uh, so uh, how we, uh, did I, I went back. Uh, what we do is we apply the fundamental theorem to the, uh, to the computation which uh, produces two copies of, uh, of the first argument and uh, applies some computable function as the second argument. So now the cleaning fixed point of this function is a virus because, so here's that function V and uh, the cleanly fixed point uh, when we run it uh, will, will give us that function. But on the other hand, uh, since that function copies V in two directions, we have two copies of V and we have F, right? So this is a, a, baby, uh, a baby example. Another one is, so some people uh, like co-algebras and, and actually lots of people have been doing uh, co-algebras for hundreds of years, uh, co-algebra for hundreds of years without calling them uh, that. All these infinitary constructions are, are co-algebras. Categorically, we all know uh, that co-algebras are, so there, there's some function. Uh, I, I believe everyone can could easily uh, spell out what on a category where everything is a rectract of a, of, of a single type uh, would count as a, would define uh, the concept of computable functor, uh, because the morphisms are, are also representable. Uh, so if we have a computable functor, and here I'm, I'm uh, slightly cheating, I, I move the part of this, of this functor uh, as, a, as a product. So here uh, I'm calling algebras these F mealy machines, if you like, where X is the state, a is the type of the inputs, and B is the type of the outputs. And then in algebra, they are, they are interested, be computational behaviors are characterized by final algebras. Well, I say that in, uh, in a computer, the uh, type of programs is not just final algebra, but it's a universal algebra, which means that it produces a weekly finite, uh, a weekly final uh, co-algebra for every computable function. So a universal co-algebra, uh, uh, a computation over quote unquote state space S uh, 
is a universal coalgebra if for any computable puncture and any coalgebra Q, there is a step function. I'm calling it intentionally the step function. This is the concept due to, to Manuel Bloom. There's a step function Q uh, such, that, uh, such that the familiar uh, square characterizing uh, final coalgebras commutes. So uh, some people call if if this uh, if this step function is unique, then this would be what they call anamorphism in in uh, in Bird Newton's uh, uh, calculations of of programs. As a string diagram, it means that we need that we need a sort of uh, uh, an F state machine, um, like like the like the one on the left. Uh, such that for every Q and uh, that, that for uh, that such that for every uh, coalgebra little Q, there is a step function big Q such that little Q post composed uh, on the state argument with big Q is obtained by just running your universal coalgebra on the little q. So how do we construct these step functions? Well, the same old thing. We apply the, 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 the fundamental theorem and we construct the cleanly fixed point this time significantly. Um, we are looking for cleanly fixed point of the post composition of our coalgebra with the partial evaluator. And that cleanly fixed point then gives us the step function. Why am I calling this step function? Well, step functions are Manuel Bloom's uh, uh, complexity measures. And this is where, where the, the point of all of this, uh, uh, where, where all of this started. I was at Drell Holloway and I was supposed to teach cryptography with one wave functions and trapdoor functions to, to students who, who uh, never had a computability course. So I, so I, I and, and, and we're kind of trying to claim that they wouldn't know what structural induction would be and so on. So I, I, I thought I would teach them computability in a month or two. And, and I started drawing these pictures and I drew the pictures to the point where, where I could draw these uh, step functions. And then that, that's how I define complexity measures and, and it, I, I managed to, to, to define one way functions in a, in a one uh, term course, which you know, me and the student, we, we claim that they learned something, but I'm not sure whether that's really true. In any case, this is one track uh, where it goes, but more generally, how do you, how do you program in this, in this uh, language with, with just universal evaluator? Well, you know, someone wants to, wants you to build a software system. A software system is a bunch of components. You know, it's an end tuple of computations. And uh, so suppose that we can write down these specifications in such a way that they, they, their mutual dependencies are written in, uh, in the way they are processing each other's programs. So if we have uh, an end tuple of computations which we view as specifications of the desired functions, then using the Kleene uh, fixed point, we can construct an n tuple of programs uh, which are fixed in the sense that when you when you feed all of these programs to to uh, to all of the, uh, when you feed all of these programs to to the given functions, you will get. Uh, what each of these programs is evaluating. So you, say you have, in a sense, implemented each of the n desired functions. You have found the program G. So in a sense, software development becomes solving uh, clean equations. Um, and just to, to, to show you how, how this construction would work, let's just Let's just look at <laughs> the software system with two components. And this is now uh, Raymond Smullyan's theorem, but uh, Raymond Smullyan uses a couple of nasty equations to, 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 to construct this. 
And I'm going to flash a very, very easy and simple picture uh, on the next slide. So, so suppose we have two computable functions, uh, each depending on two programs. And we want to find two programs, big G and big H, such that little g partially evaluated on big G and big H is big G. And little h partially evaluated on big G and, uh, and big H is the evaluation of big H. So this is this is the requirement of of mutual uh, mutual determination of uh, of computable functions. And how do we construct this? Well, we play exactly the same the same game. These two uh, program inputs are both uh, precomposed with partial evaluators, and uh, and then we uh, pipe the two desired programs g and h where they belong uh, in the at the at the evaluation uh, port of the first partial evaluator and at the input port of the second partial evaluator we we uh, pipe g and uh, the, the other way around with h and by uh, the cleany fixed point theorem we find the cleany fixed point of each of these functions and uh, the, the, the fact that, uh, that they do what they're supposed to do uh, follows from, from these pictures. So uh, if I substitute G and H uh, in each of my partial evaluators, I get the first picture and, and, and we see that, uh, that the G, uh, which is the uh, partial evaluation of uh, G on H, uh, will be the first fixed point and H, which is the partial evaluation of H on G, will be uh, analogously the second fixed point. And then how, can, how do we program other things? Um, well, we don't use Church's uh, numerals because, uh, because then we run in trouble with the predecessor. We use, uh, we use these, uh, the idea for numbers, which goes back to, to, to the 17-year-old uh, Janos Neumann or Neumann Janos, uh, the, the the way the way he was called before he, while he was still missing uh, phone, uh, and uh, and then uh, an easy uh, way to encode and a convenient way to encode this uh, was was already extensively used in 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 Hank Bandrecht's book. The nice thing, so so you uh, take the each each number is the successor of the previous number by uh, prepending false to it. And zero is an extensional fixed point of a uh, prepend of itself with truth, which is nice because now we have a uh, zero test. Our zero test is the first projection. Our successor is prepend false and uh, the base case we can construct again using the fixed point theorem. Uh, where, where does the tupling come from? Well, we know that uh, every type is, uh, is a retract of programs. In other words, it can be encoded as a program. And among other types, the product uh, of two copies of programs can be encoded as a program. So, so this, this gives us the injective pairing. And uh, so that is what, what we use to, to construct the numbers. And uh, so like I, like I just said, uh, the, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I've already said this predecessor will be, will be the second projection. The zero test will be the first projection. And here they are. Uh, zero is the evaluation of the Kleene fixed point of of the suitable function. The successor is prepend uh, false. Uh, predecessor is the second projection. Uh, zero test is the, is the first projection. And we can now construct the type of numbers as an idempotent. How do we do that? We take an arbitrary program. If it's zero, we output it. This equality comes from the, from the well ordering. Um, 
So we test uh, less, less than equal or, or and greater than equal. And if we recognize zero, we output. Uh, otherwise, if the first, if it's, if it looks like it might be a successor of something because the first projection is false, then we pass the second projection back to the same function. And it uh, descends down until it sees zero and it climbs all the way up to give us back uh, the, uh, the previous number, the predecessor, which we then output back out. Uh, if none of this is true, if there is no chance, if, if our input is neither zero nor has a chance of being a successor, then we diverge. So here is the idempotent. So I'm, I'm running through this just to illustrate how uh, we draw these pictures as, 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 as actual programs. So here is the idempotent, which filters uh, natural numbers uh, in, in Hank Bandrecht's and, and Neumann Janosch's. Uh, form uh, out of all programs, out of the well ordering of, uh, of programs. Um, how do we diverge? Well, the diverge is this omega, the cleanly fixed point of applying self application to itself. So, omega is the cleanly fixed point of this second thing. And uh, so, if, okay, so I've said this. Uh, then the divergence, again, this is, this is all, all in lambda calculus, the divergence is the self-application of omega, uh, which means that, uh, yeah, well, I, I think we invented math because at places like this, translating it into English becomes clumsy, even for people who speak English a little better than I, or much better. But in any case, this is, uh, this is the familiar uh, definition of divergence. Recursion, how do we define recursion? So now I'm going to start, how much of your time have I used up? I'm, I'm coming close to, to an hour. Uh, how do we define recursion? So recursion schema is the familiar thing with successor and so on. And I probably don't need to, uh, to explain that, but I'm going to draw it in string diagrams. So uh, a function recursively defined uh, using the base case G and the step, case, uh, step uh, case and the st yeah, step case H, uh, which in, in uh, calculating programs is called catamorphism and, it, and it's, it's, it's denoted by these by these banana brackets or the, the banana functions, uh, I denote it. I denote it by by these ovals. So what? The, so here's the, the you know pictorial definition of, of primitive recursion. It should the, the word primitive doesn't belong here, but anyway. Um, so the base case of the oval is the function g. The step case of the oval is the function h post composed on the output of the oval and uh, receiving back the copies of, of both the uh, counter and the parameter a. So we have just drawn the usual uh, primitive recursion clauses as pictures. And then this shows us why is uh, recursive evaluation, the worst possible way to, to compute because uh, the only computation is to count down. I mean, programmers, of course, know this, but not in pictures. So I at least enjoy showing this picture because it shows uh, that recursion is counting down. And here is the definition of the uh, recursion oval in terms of just partial evaluators and the fixed point. So we can do, so in any monoidal computer, uh, as soon as we have, uh, so all that we have assumed were universal evaluators. As soon as we have universal evaluators, we have uh, booleans, we have numbers, we have uh, 
we have primitive recursion and i'm not going to go on to show you that we also that we also have halting problem and that we have while loops and that we have minimization let's get more ambitious let's get to super compilers so this is the what's known as first futamura projection if you have a high high level programming language uh, which is friendly but clumsy uh, well friendly for people but clumsy for computers and you have uh, low level programming language all in your uh, in your computer which is uh, uh, clumsy but friendly clumsy uh, for for people but friendly for computers you can then of course uh, by the definition of a of a programming language you can write the interpreter for your high level language in your low level language and you can partially evaluate it and that's a compiler uh, although this is called futamura projection from futamura's paper which is i think 94 or something this was in Corrado Böhm's thesis from 1950s. And Valentin Turchin wrote a Soviet book which goes beyond this in the 80s. You can go further. So now you have, of course, this compiler, which uh, you can again write in your low level language. And, uh, and there's a program for it. So then you can partially evaluate your program for partial evaluator. And this is a super compiler. If the first compiler optimized your program by 10 times, now you have optimized your compiler and you're optimizing by 100 times. This was uh, Turchin's and, and, and Futamura's uh, argument. And still the construction is in Corrado Böhm's thesis from, I think, 1954. The last step, uh, compiler generator is in Turchin's book from the 80s and also in, in Futamura's book. Uh, so now you have this uh, partial evaluator, which, which, is, uh, which is evaluated on the interpreter. So, but on the other hand, since you have the program for this partial evaluator, you can partially evaluate that program on itself and uh, that is partial uh, self-partial evaluation. So uh, here at the heart of the supercompiler is a supercompiler generator. So all of that we can, uh, th so this is, this is kind of like meta-programming uh, view of, so we're, we're now, we're now uh, programming computations which compute on programs. And uh, with that, we would go beyond iteration we can we can we can spell out a, a simple iterator for for Ackermann function. But now I'm going to flash very quickly how we can how we can do things. Uh, all of this was in another sense uh, implicit in in well ordering uh, of all types, which Cantor assumed. So uh, in order to iterate anything, we just need to to uh, accumulate the inputs. So here, here is the, the definition of a, of a general cumulative iterator, which I, so in order to, uh, to cumulatively iterate any given function, little sigma, which I draw as a circle because the idea is that it will be the successor, uh, I need the cleanly fixed point of uh, running, uh, running that, that function sigma, uh, on what will be the iterator and then uh, accumulating the original input of, of all of that. So I take my input, I run sigma and I run it through the iterator and I keep the inputs. Uh, now, not only do I, did I, was I able to define natural numbers, but here is the, the uh, first transfinite ordinal which is obtained by uh, cumulatively iterating the successor on zero. And it's easy to see uh, that, that it outputs uh, all natural numbers. Uh, then if you cumulatively iterate on that, you can, you can get further transfinite number and the products, and we get in 
to the main theorem, which is in a sense, the only categorical surprise here. So a monoidal category with data services can be a computer in at most one way. If, um, if you have two programming languages and two universal uh, evaluators in your monoidal category, uh, then there are strict programs, there are strict program transformers uh, between your two programming languages, which, uh, which yield the isomorphism between these two programming languages. It's easy to see that, that they can, that any computer can, com can interpret any computer, but it takes, uh, it takes some uh, Cantor uh, Bernstein theorem uh, encoding via Hartley Rogers to prove this isomorphism theorem. In the category, this isomorphism theorem gives something uh, pretty unexpected. Uh, so the original intentional view of computation was in what came to be known as the church during thesis also, although Turing didn't intend to. To say that uh, most of it is due to Kleene, but what it says is that uh, all that all of these models of computation that have been given, in particular the lambda calculus, the recursive functions, and the Turing machines, simulate uh, one another. Uh, however, each of them uh, can simulate any other. Uh, in many different ways, and you can prove that it can simulate it in infinitely many ways, and each of them can simulate itself in infinitely many ways. Uh, in order to get away from, from this and to, to do some <laughs> category theory, uh, semantic, semanticists uh, following Dana Scott developed denotational semantics and said, uh, model computations, not programs, and they worked we, we, many of us live most of our lives in these Cartesian closed categories. And the nice thing about them is that they are not, not these fluffy, flabby structures, but they are properties. A category can be Cartesian closed in at most one way. And this theorem says that a monoidal category can be a computer in at most one way that computability is a property. So that, that, you know, we have, on one hand, we have just thrown another, another model in the, in the church during bestiarium, but in the other sense, uh, the, the models here are unique and the monoidal computer models itself uh, in a unique way up to isomorphism. And here's an exercise for you to show that um, on one hand we have these, these uh, natural isomorphisms, X natural in X, which form the uh, Artesian closed structure. And here we have natural surjections. Now, I don't know of, of a definition of a surjection, a cover, which as given is unique with respect to inverse images. And, and here this miracle of programmability gives us this. So thanks for, for listening and, 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 and sorry if it took too long. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, uh, uh, thank you very much. Any questions? It's a, it was a full thing. Uh, Peter, please. Hi, Dushka. Thank you for the talk. Um, I have a question that, that uh, may not surprise you. Um, uh, Robin and I try to do something um, a little bit similar to, to the kind of work you've presented, but not on the level of monoidal categories, but on the level of partial map categories when we did our work on Turing categories. Um, and of course, this was not um, terribly original because there have been precursors where people try to give categorical accounts of, uh, of combinatory or functional completeness. 
Um, but I was wondering if you can maybe say something about how the monoidal approach compares to either Turing categories or the, the other approaches to, um, well, the category theory behind combinatory completeness or Turing completeness. I don't think that, that I would know how to, uh, I, I, okay, yeah, I mean, it, it is not surprising me. I am familiar with your work. I'm not very familiar with your, with your work. I, I, I read the paper, but I, I can't say that I read it with a pencil. Uh, so um, I would not know, maybe you would know how to prove with, uh, I mean, you know, th this is Heller's partial, uh, partial dominions or, or, or something where, where the original way to, to try to capture uh, partial, partial computable functions uh, in, in a categorical way. I somehow, well, I mean, first of all, the word originality in all of this for me uh, is kind of opposite from what we should be doing. Because I think we're, 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 not, we're not inventing anything. We're discovering a law of nature. You know, the, the, fact, the fact that things are computable and the fact that, that computability is a, is a property is more, I would think, a matter for biology and life and, and, and how, do, how do things in the universe rewrite than for some mathematical invention. So I, you know, not only for myself, do I not claim any, any originality or, or invention here, but I, I kind of don't, don't project them very much into the work of others. I don't think that, uh, I think the entire approach through recursion was kind of, you know, politics of, of Alonzo Church trying to get Gödel's approval and then it was all called recursion theory and suddenly things which were computable were treated as partial, partial recursive functions. So I, I'm not, you know, I was kind of maybe from the outset because of that history prejudiced against approach through, through looking at, at which functions are partial. And I wouldn't know how to prove this uniqueness by using that, that formalism. But on the other hand, uh, saying that there's, there's, a, there's an essential conceptual difference between, between making things monoidal and making them, them, them uh, partial, I, I wouldn't say that either, you know, or, or at some level, it's a cosmetic difference. At another level, when we say monoidal, we can, uh, so any, any computational effect, not only partiality and not only non-determinism, but anything that, 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 can, be, uh, that can be captured, uh, not, not just as a monad, but also modulo. So my, my goal here was, uh, was complexity. And then uh, if I take, if I take uh, 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 tractable functions modulo um, indistinguishability, I would be I would be paying to 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 embed that into a into a category with a partiality, and it's a monoidal category on the node. So I mean, it's a matter of taste. I I I'm not I'm not sure that that it's a big difference. But yeah, on the I other hand, you know, I'm, I'm obviously biased and I, I, I think, I, like I said, I, I didn't, I never thought that I, I could work with these partialities. I certainly couldn't sell them to, to students. And now in Hawaii, I'm teaching this to undergraduate students for already five years who walk into the class straight with solemn oath that they have never heard of induction over natural numbers. And I sell them on these pictures, and they walk out, and they claim to know what's a what's a uh, what's a trapdoor function. And you know, I mean, I like pictures, <laughs> but uh, you know, there's nothing. I'm not. It's not. It's not a very serious claim, and I, I, I don't have a serious answer to your question. I, I was sort of hoping at some point when you brought in single values and total, that there might be some result that says if you take one of your uh, monoidal categories, and and you look at the the subcategory on the single valued, 
morphisms that maybe then you get uh, towards some kind of comparison? Well, there, 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 I, I have a, I'm, I'm not sure that I have a strong proposition about that, but I do have a couple of propositions which say that when I do such things, uh, the models collapse to es essentially extensional models. Uh, as soon as, <clears throat> as soon as there is an even, even an implicit form of abstraction. So as soon as we have the S of combinatory algebras, it's an essentially extensional model. We can derive, we can derive the lambda abstraction, and there's an extensional collapse, and there's a and there's a Cartesian closed category living in it. And the the all the all the quotienting, uh, you know, the, the undecidable quotienting which which emerges everywhere in uh, semantics of computation when we when we take when we take these programming languages and squash them to, to something that, that uh, has, a, has a Cartesian closed category emerging from it, uh, you know, we, we lose the intentional content, and we, that which, which is fine, you know, I mean, it's a glorious theory, denotational semantics, but it can do complexity theory. You know, we can't, we can't count we can't count how, how many steps, we can't count space, we, we can't count uh, how, how much randomness. And that part, it doesn't do. Semantics of computation has remained disjoint from algorithmics for that reason. But, you know, I'm, I'm not adversarial about it at all. <laughs> Any other questions? I have a quick question. Um, let's say I wanted to do quantum computation. So what type of categorical structure would work there? In other words, I would have thought you could do everything with Cartesian categories rather than monoidal categories, but you're, you're, you're doing monoidal categories. In quantum, you, you don't have the, the, you have no deleting, you have no copying, you have no broadcasting let's say you wanted to generalize to there, what, what would one have to do? What type of structure would one have to have? It's, a, I mean, I was, I, I was kind of working this out on the, on the back of Bob's, Bob Kukes and, and my models of, <laughs> of quantum, uh, uh, of quantum computers. Uh, we, so there, very specifically, the distinction between between classical state, what's his name? His name is Baruch, and he doesn't want to go to sleep on time. <laughs> Hi, Baruch. Uh, the distinction between classical state and and uh, the distinction between classical state and and quantum state is that classical state is uh, is copyable and and deletable. So, very specifically. Uh, we have filters here. We have filters for classical data. As soon as I as I feed something through through the uh, through uh, data service, uh, the state quantum state has collapsed. So so my my quantum computation is strictly living on the right hand side of this surjection. And as soon as I have started extracting programs, which are these these things that 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 do do have to uh, to produce distinct uh, output deterministically uh, that, that th those are quantum programs so so Deutsch's distinction of classical programs for quantum uh, computers is built in into the into the structure of the of the computer itself uh, beyond that um, it depends on what kind of quantum computation one wants to model uh, some, some with some kind of tolerance and, and factoring, people have been managing to to uh, to squeeze some quantum algorithms behind monads. Uh, in other respects, some quantum phenomena, such as well, not quantum phenomena, but measurements, modeling measurements, is out of question. If we if we try to <clears throat> to hide quantum state behind behind monads. So uh, on one hand, uh, 
it very much caters for, for that question because these data services very specifically cater for classical state. Well, I mean, after all, you know, the only things that we can pass by variables are classical data. But uh, how, do we, how do we model measurements that will give some variation uh, in, in different monoidal computers? But I, I, I vouch that it definitely accommodates, I believe, all, all models of, mono, of uh, quantum computation that, that have been presented in, in, in literature that I'm aware of. Th thank you. Just one, one more thing on your, your main theorem. It, uh, the point is it's it, all computation is is isomorphic, but not uniquely isomorphic. In other no, words, here, uh -huh. not uniquely isomorphic. No. Right. So, so, so for you know a product in a category is is unique up to a unique isomorphism, and this is unique just up to a, up. To yes. A, yes. A, yes. So, so what you what you're saying what you're saying is absolutely true. The 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 translations of programs into programs are reversible but they are not coherent right so so you can you can have many compilers and uh, maybe there's some higher level thing compilers of compilers that show that they're all doing the same thing but 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 uh, you have many different compilers yeah they are well, but you see what emerged. The reason there's a there's a you know strong reason this non-coherence is stratified. It's stratified by Turing degrees. So it's a very narrow escape. This isomorphism theorem is a very, very narrow escape. You know, it's it's the strongest, the strongest thing that, that, that can be said, because if we if we had the coherence, I, you know, initially, that's why that's why I needed to think. Initially, I thought I thought I'm missing something. This is this is not not coherent, but it is it is not coherent for the very specific reason. It's what what's making it non-coherent is the jump operator. The jump and and you 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 immediately sensed it. The jump operator is 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 uh, is actually. No, it's preventing from higher. Uh, it, it's preventing the high order compiler from classifying all of these because then we would have the we would have the uh, we would have the completeness results for 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 uh, for Turing degrees. Very very nice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Any other questions? Okay, otherwise we, we thank you again, Dasko, thank you very much. Um, Thanks for inviting. Right. Um, in two weeks, we're having Marco Schorlemmer speak. Um, and you're all welcome to come and join. And uh, it's, it's a pleasure. Anyways, Dasko, thank you very much. Take care.